Good morning once again, and welcome to you all for this uh, webinar on the state of democracy in the Gambia. Uh, I have my two lovely colleagues, uh, Omurara Balogun and Jim Chikfumujo, who will be the main facilitator of this webinar. So before I give them the floor, I mean, to kickstart the process, I would like uh, to go through these ground rules that will guide, I mean, the two-hour session to ensure that we have a very smooth session, especially as we are having it on, I mean, virtually on Zoom platform. So uh, to start with, uh, the first ground rules is let us kindly ensure that we have our name written, I mean, uh, on the platform. I think for all of us here, we have done that. So thank you so much for that. And the second point is to ensure that we keep our microphone muted. I mean, especially when we are not speaking uh, to, to, to avoid interference and also background noise. Uh, let us keep our microphone muted when we are not speaking. Uh, the third one is, uh, I would like to highlight the fact that we have, I mean, uh, various functionality that allow us also to participate, we as participants. Uh, the first one is to raise our hands. There is a dedicated button for that. You raise at your hands and the moderator will definitely give you the floor for you to, 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 to speak. And uh, the second option is the chat sections, and that is accessible to all of us. I've seen several colleagues, I mean, writing there. I've seen my colleague, Jim Chick, that have just written fat matter on the chat section. So let us also make use of the chat sections. When you have any comment, question, or contribution, please share it, I mean, through the chat section. Uh, the moderator will definitely read it out. And we also here as support team, we will also prompt them. I mean, anytime there is a comment in the chat section. Now, uh, for, I mean, the next ones, if it happens in the event that it happened that you lose your connection, kindly you reconnect using the same link that was sent to you via your email. If it happens, you lose your connection. Kindly reconnect using the same link to join us here. And uh, the next point uh, is that we would like also to inform you that uh, we'll be recording these sessions. I mean, share it live on my Facebook page. And also record it. The record will be posting on our YouTube page. I mean, later on for other people, for one or the other reason, could not join us today, could also, I mean, to watch it later. So thank you so much to you all for being on time. And we are very grateful having you. I will now hand over to Lara and Jim, our main moderator for this session. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Leanne. And uh, thank you to everyone who is here with us this good morning. I'm sure we all enjoyed the beautiful music from the coastland country of the Gambia, the wonderful country that of course I am dreaming to visit someday. I'm sure Fatumata will invite me before this year runs out and hopefully before the elections that we will be talking about shortly. Omolara, how are you today, please? Hello. Hi, good morning, and colleagues. Good morning from Freetown, Sierra Leone. Good morning. Happy to be here. Great. Thank you very much, Omolara, and uh, thank you to everyone who is here with us this morning to have an, uh, a discussion around the state of democracy and governance in the Gambia. It is critical to have this discussion at this time, given that the elections are not far from us and everyone is looking up to the Gambia, a country that has been on the spotlight for positive proceedings in the realm of democracy. We all remember 2017 was a landmark year in the country when the hard fist ruler of, uh, in the person of uh, Yaya Jame was uh, um, offseated by the current president Adama Baro. That gave hope 
you know, for democracy in West Africa and uh, the continent as a whole. But since 2017 to date, there have been several proceedings that are raising the need for us to interrogate or question the path or the trajectory of democracy in the country today. And of course, to have this uh, discussion, we will be talking to key actors in the democracy landscape in the civic space in the Gambia, who will be sharing, sharing their perspectives with us to enable us to understand the context better, to enable us to understand the issues better, and of course, to understand the opportunities that the upcoming ele elections that will be coming up in December this year actually provide, not only for democracy and governance in the Gambia, but as a whole for the entire region and why not the continent. And uh, to enable us to know who will be sharing their insights with us, I will be, of course, inviting my amiable colleague, Omolara Balogun from the beautiful city of Freetown to introduce to us our panelists. Omolara, you have the floor, please. Yeah, thank you so much, Jim. And thanks, colleagues, for joining all over West Africa and even beyond. My name is Omolara Balugu and I work with the West Africa Civil Society Institute as the heads of policy influence and advocacy. Uh, I think, uh, Jim, I was almost thinking this seems like a family conversation because all the speakers are people that we have not only worked with, but I mean, these are known names within the development landscape uh, on the continent, I should say. So it's really a, a, a joy to see Honorable Fatumata again. <laughs> I think I saw you last in Abuja. So let me just go over the uh, uh, short profile of our speakers for today. So we have Honorable Dialu Tambajan, who is a Gambian politician and a social activist. She served as, a, as the vice president of the Gambian and Minister of Women's Affairs from February 2007 to June 2008 under this current President Adam Mabaru. Prior to her appointment, she had served as the chair of coalition in 2016, the Alliance of Opposition Political Parties that supported the candidacy of President Barrow in the 2016 presidential elections. Uh, she was also the chair of the Gambian National Women's Council and an advisor to Dawa Jawara, the first president of the Gambia. And after the military coup in July 1994, uh, which deposed Jawara of, his, of, the gov of his government, she held the post of Secretary of State of Health uh, for Health and Social Welfare from 1994 to 1995 uh, in, within the cabinet of the Armed Forces Provisional Ruling Council. So Madam, I, I, I see, and we can all see the many caps you're wearing this morning. Thank you so much for joining this conversation. We also have our very own popular uh, uh, Madi Jubate, who is a human rights defender. Madi has over 25 years experience in pro promoting democracy and human rights in the Gambia and across the continent. Madi has been actively involved in array of development issues on African continent, specifically promoting uh, citizens empowerment. And of course, he all is currently the executive director of the association. The, he was the former executive director of the Association of Non-Governmental Organizations in the Gambia Tango and is the member of the Foundation for Legal Aid Research and Empowerment, FLAIR in the Gambia as well. Currently, Madi serves as the uh, executive director of Westminster Foundation for Democracy in Gambia. Madi, I'm happy to see you again. <laughs> uh, and of course, we have um, Mohamed Lamin, who is a co-coordinator of the African Rising Movement. Uh, Mohammed is uh, one of was one of the on most hundred most influential young leaders in Africa in 2019. Uh, pardon me for that. And he was also recognized as the most influential people of African descent uh, under the 40 worldwide in support of United Nations International Decade 
for people of African descent in 2020. Con congratulations for that. And prior to joining African Rising, he coordinated an alliance of 11 member farmer based alliance called National Alliance for Food Security in the Gambia and also served as the first youth co-chair of Action Aid International Youth Working Group. And uh, Lamine was also the lead coordinator of the youth-led activist star initiative. Lamine, it's good to see you again. And the last but not the least on, on the list of speaker today is uh, Adija Jawara, who is an external affairs consultant for the World Bank in the Gambia. Adija also worked for the Gambian Press Union as a senior program officer, and she has practiced journalism for over 10 years and has real experience working with media and coordinating activities of both traditional and new media across the Gambia. Uh, she has also held positions of coordinating the Gambia Press Union School of Journalism, now called the Media Academy for Journalism and Communication. And she has also served as treasurer of the Gambia Press Union Board and president of the Debate Gambian Society. And these are the speakers that we have today. Uh, would you like to say something to welcome us, Madam, Madam Tambajan? Can we start with you? I'm sure colleagues will want to hear you. You can unmute yourself, please. It shows how I'm serving IT. <laughs> Anyway, good morning, everybody. Honorable House, um, good morning, excellent moderator. I'm really honored and pleased to be part of this um, very important uh, forum. Um, by no means, uh, the names and the positions, credentials speak to themselves. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, most grateful for the consideration because uh, I'm sure that you have many more others out there um, who can talk about uh, democracy and governance in the Gambia. Finally, I wish this forum, this uh, conference an unprecedented success and that be the key, not only for Gambia, but for countries in Africa, in our continent. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Honorable. Thank you so much for, for this words. Madi, can, can you say a few words to us? <laughs> well, just to say, great to be here. Um, I guess it's an ongoing conversation. So uh, we look forward to um, a great conversation, you know, with all of you. Um, you know, Gambia is at a critical time right now. Um, especially towards the election. So there's no better time, you know, and uh, a subject to discuss than now uh, and this subject. So great to be here and looking forward to a good conversation. Thank you, Madi. Lami, I see you're smiling already. You know you're next. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm honored to be sharing a panel with, you know, the great minds that are really moving and shaping democracy in Gambia. I'm happy to be sharing the panel with Mom Fatmata, Her Excellency, and as well Uncle Madi. You know, she's, he's a very great comrade, and as well Sister Haji. As Madi said, we are at a critical point right now as a country, and we hope that uh, the country will receive well to make Gambians proud but also to make democracy uh, a reality that anyone can copy from. I think we have tested what is we can, we are on the right track. If we really hold things right, definitely Gambia would be an example for all. So that's why this very important discussion is critical for all of us. Thank you, Lamin. Um, Adija, are you there? I'm not sure I've seen you this morning. If you are there, can you say a word to us? Uh, good morning, everyone. Ah. Um, yeah, <laughs> I've been around for a while now. Uh, I'm honored to be here and in the presence of uh, great minds like Madam Fatma Tajalo Tambajang, 
Madi, like Lamin said, is our uncle. We call him Uncle Madi. We are always happy to be around him. And Lamin has been a while. And thank you, Waxi, for inviting us to this event. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Thank you so much. We, we really want to appreciate the time that uh, you all very busy people have created to join this conversation. Now, uh, uh, when Jim started, I, I was thinking in my head that uh, the Gambia project, as we used to call it in 2016, is still very much a thing of interest, not only to us in West Africa, but across the continent and even globally. This is a first time the world really wants to see a test of our democracy in the Gambia. And I'm sure uh, uh, you would have, I mean, from the conversations you've been having, both within and outside the Gambia, you can feel the tempo that a lot of us are interested on what is going on. So we are going to be interrogating a little bit about the states of democracy, you know, uh, uh, governance, civic engagement uh, uh, in the Gambia, especially uh, within this um, first five year that we have experienced together post Germain. So um, uh, your excellency, I would like to begin with you. It's interesting that you have been uh, a part of both words. I remember uh, you were actively involved in regional civil society conversation uh, uh, as at the last time I, 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 I uh, you know, had a direct contact with you in, in Abuja then. And you are actually a very strong voice when it comes to, you know, the civil, civil society, civic space, citizens, you know, uh, 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 engagement. And at the same time, you have been a part of this government, holding an important position as a vice president in a position of this of this government. With all this in mind, uh, uh, Your Excellency, I would like to ask, how would you describe to us, based on your knowledge from the people's perspective and from government side, how would you describe the current political climate in the country as we, you know, look forward to this uh, 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 unique election? Because this is the first time we are holding elections without Jamea in the future. This is our war elections. I would like you to speak to that. How would you describe the political climate ahead of the elections in, in December? What, what, what would you like to see based on that? Madam, you have the floor. Please check your mic, Madam. Um, thank you so much. I'm very happy to be among um, distinguished panelists and um, diverse also in the sense that you, you have Waxi, the organizers who have been kind enough to bring us on board. Um, first of all, your question is very pertinent, um, but before I answer it, I would rather say uh, my humble opinion is that the Gambia is not at a critical time. The Gambia is at a very interesting time. Uh, interesting in terms of uh, uh, the way that uh, the whole world is watching over Gambia to see how uh, we are going with our democracy and how it can become a beacon of hope for Africa and the world at large. Um, I see it interesting because that makes it more engaging and it makes it more inspiring for, for people to come on board. Today, um, we have a, a number of um, challenges and uh, wherever you have challenges, of course, you have opportunities. Um, as an optimist, uh, I think uh, Gambia is on the right track um, in the sense that uh, People are now getting more engaged in politics. Civil society is getting engaged. The youth and women are getting engaged. Everybody's interested to know how government, how they are governed, which is very important. In the past, we didn't have that opportunity. We had the opportunity. We didn't have. We didn't. We didn't have that opportunity because it was of a dictator, dictatorial uh, regime. But now we have the opportunity. And uh, more importantly, Gambians are determined that no more dictatorship in the Gambia, which is quite interesting. Um, 
challenges uh, the fact that uh, in 2016, when we ushered democracy, uh, we had an agenda. The coalition 2016, which you rightly explained, um, is a, a composition, co consists of, of many political parties, civil society, and NGOs. And um, we had an agenda. And of course, if you look at the coalition 2016 agenda, is the agenda of the government that is being implemented right now. Um, the agenda was focused on reforms, constitutional reform, legal reform, judiciary, uh, land uh, reform, uh, civil society, uh, security, and um, uh, you name it. Um, unfortunately, I was in government. Uh, when I say unfortunately, not because I was in government, but I'm saying unfortunately, because we could not get the money the funds that were required to implement the agenda to the letter. Um, the agenda is yet is still hanging. It has not been completed. Uh, I will rate it at maybe 30% as a development practitioner and a political activist. Um, the number two challenge is the, the, the lack of political will uh, to implement, to, to, to hasten or to accelerate uh, the political agenda. Why I say that, I like to really give evidence because academic is evidence and uh, as a believer also you have to give evidence to people for your credibility and also for accountability. Um, I would say we had not expected that the political leadership will, will now ask uh, to run for another term uh, because what was signed was that after three years, he will um, uh, seek power to, um, uh, will call on elections and people will contest and whoever wins, wins. And everybody will support that. But un unfortunately, because of, which is the challenge tied to a lack of funding, uh, we had the pledges of the um, donors, 1.4 billion. And, uh, but up to now we have not got the, the funding. Uh, in my humble mind, I would have thought that with the little we had, we could have done focus if the political leadership, if the government had focused on implementing, implementing, enforcing the reforms, um, including uh, something that I don't need to miss is the Truth and Reconciliation Mission and Commission, which is uh, geared towards uh, reconciling the, the country after so many years of atrocities, heinous crimes rape and murders and disappearances uh, created by the, the previous regime. But because of the, the shift of focus of the political leadership, or I would say political leadership, I give it the responsibility to the people. Lost you, we lost your sound for a bit, please. But, um, yeah, I think it's bad, but it's faint. Is it okay? Can you hear me? The, the, the sound is still faint. I, I think it's the connection that is uh, the stable. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, my last point was um, the context. Um, I was uh, just uh, in, within the description of uh, the context. Um, I'm saying that the because of the lack of focus, the, the, invo the, the commitment of the political leadership to run for a second term, little focus has been given, little or no focus has been given to completing the reform agenda. Uh, that's it. Uh, thirdly, I must say that the, um, 
the implementation, the selective justice of the commission on the assets of the former uh, dictator has left the, the, the people of the Gambia, particularly civil society, young people, has left them with some um, disappointment, desperation. Uh, we would have expected that the commission's findings, the report would have been implemented to the letter, but that has not been done. It has been done uh, haphazardly. It's been just selective justice. Um, then also now the truth and rec reconciliation. What will be submitted, if I'm right, in, in July. And everybody, every person in the Gambia citizen is looking forward to how that would be uh, handled. Um, we are in a way of uh, um, way of um, really uh, not really comfortable with the fact that the present government is uh, trying as much as possible to enter into alliance with the APRC government, the former government, which has really created so this country something that nobody would like to have in any country. And that is also making go, uh, people very, very easy, people very uh, uncomfortable. But in terms of opportunities, the challenges are many. Of course, we have got, there's still poverty. The poverty has really not declined. Um, you have, you still have uh, people who are in our up countries that are really disadvantage in terms of access to social services. Now with the unprecedented and unforeseen circumstances of the COVID-19, people are yet to have water to wash their hands, to follow the WHO protocols. How would you tell people who are poor to buy a mask and uh, or, or buy a mask, clean water and uh, social distancing when they don't have access to putting the basic necessities uh, on the table and really educating their children and so forth. The roads are there. They have been, in terms of opportunity, they've been building roads and so forth. But I would think that if you look at the macroeconomic today, it has been driven, the economy is being driven by debt. We are indebted, the debt rate is very high. The economy is not moving. And um, it's not moving when I say it's not moving because people still have, don't have three meals a day. Uh, the, the commodities, uh, there is a, uh, inflation rate is very high, the cost of living is very high, and people have been, there is an outcry, overwhelming outcry on the part of population for, for, for the government to, to decrease the, uh, the prices, com prices of commodities. I do understand as a development practitioner for so many years um, that, uh, of course, the prices are determined by the um, the, the, the market, but there are so many things that we can do. Basic as growing rice, growing basic commodity, uh, commodities in our country, like rice. When I was growing young, we, Gambia used to feed itself. Even like uh, 15 years ago, Gambia used to feed itself, but now we cannot, we, we have the land. And uh, the other best challenge and opportunity would be the challenge of really, not supporting any of the indigenous enterprises, in the indigenous businesses. These are the people who are Gambians. They are the people who would stay and live and work and create jobs for, for our people. But because of the, you look at the, the, on the job market today, the employment rate is skyrocketing. Youth are still walking around the street and these are important people. These are the future leaders of tomorrow. These are the people, the majority of the electorate that brought the coalition into, into, into power. Well, opportunities for me, I think as an optimist, is that everybody's getting more aware about the political situation. They are getting more engaged in the political situation. I see that a civil society is up. Part of the challenge would be also the truncated nature of civil society. We don't have a very strong civil society. Civil society sometimes is just a group of people. We need a civil society that is strong, that can, that can hold government accountable. Not civil society of groups, of course, is good. Instrumental, there are instrumentalists, there are people who are very critical, the critical mass is there, but this needs to be diversified, it needs to be strengthened 
from, from, from the capital to the last village so that people can be uh, educated, civic education and so forth. Now the political process, December, okay. I will close by uh, that the political process is now up and running. People are waiting to vote. I am advocating for all youths. I will start my campaign to have every youth and every woman, everybody to come out and register, register and register. Because they had said that votes uh, will not uh, remove a dictator. But we have seen that uh, voting and making your voice count is the most important thing. So I would allow the other speakers, Madam Moderator, to compliment uh, the gaps that I may have uh, inadvertently yeah. left, left because of uh, missing of time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. And, and I think you've actually touched most of the critical points, especially from the political uh, from the uh, uh, political processes side. And I, I really appreciate the, the fact that you also went way beyond to also share with us from the people's side. And that's why I was uh, reiterating the many caps that you wear in this kind of gathering. Thank you so much, Madam. And uh, I'm coming to you. Uh, Our Excellency mentioned some of the opportunities that we have, as well as challenges that we should be tackling ahead of the election. She mentioned the fact that uh, uh, we have not, I'm saying we because like I said, when I started, the Gambian project had been something that has you know, been our collective responsibility as our civil society actors in, in the region. Uh, as she talked about, you know, the lack of political wills, lack of resources to implement most of the promises that this government, you know, made at the start of their tenure, constitutional, legal, uh, uh, security reforms and all of that. From your own perspective as a civil society person, social activist, a person who is you know, based in the Gambia, can you, from where you sit, share with us the risk or opportunities that we have as a people to go into these elections in a credible, free and fair manner? Do you think all things being equal, this election is not, it's going to be credible, it's going to be fair, and it will reflect the true uh, 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 I mean, and it will safeguard the interest of an average Gambian. Can you tell us from what, where you sit, what do you see and what should we be on the lookout for? Lamin, you have the next five minutes, please. Thank you, Amolora. Um, yeah, I want to commend um, Madam Vice President for that elaborate um, analysis of the situation. I wanted to say that, yeah, um, you know, there is a bit hope. There is a hope. There is a hope that you know people are people have tested waters to do a to take a, part, a journey that have been more difficult and challenging than what we are faced with now. So people are really confident. I want to say that the hope that that, that is clear is that the government have really uh, created and have allowed you know freedom of expression. Uh, where people express some, uh, it comes with, um, with some connotations of bit of challenges. Um, but when people rise up to challenge those um, intimidation that government um, apparatus will put on certain people, we've seen that they have been reacting to withdraw or take back tracks on stepping on the rights of people who raise their voice against injustices or who raise their voice concerning issue. So that created some bit of hope that they are allowing that, um, uh, you know, open participation and open um, political processes um, there. But I will say that, you know, this particular government um, have betrayed many trust of Gambians um, in many ways uh, from the processes of reforms that should have safeguarded that should have advanced the rights of Gambians to be able to partake in a free, fair, and progressive elections have been betrayed from the, from the onset. 
Uh, you might know that you know the likes of Solo Sandeng and, and his team have put their lives on the line to seek for electoral reforms. But because of the betrayal of the reform processes that the government has, that is not materialized. We, we, are, we are going through elections with, with the old electoral law. We are going through elections with the old constitution. Um, um, and these are all challenges that are that are really not giving um, much hope that it could have been given. But I want to say that um, again, you know, an open process of allowing all inclusive participation in the election process also have been started. Uh, the diaspora and Gambian in diaspora are not voting. Uh, government have given a lot of plenty excuses here and there that they don't have money, the budget was not submitted on time. So these have all started from hopes here and there. But there is hope that we have credible people in the in the um, electoral commission, the IEC. They have did it before when it was very hard for to conduct a free, uh, free and fair election. And we have that hope that yes, they can do it. Again, um, you know, there have been a very creative room for or a big space for political parties to you know to, you know, to come up on, on board. So right now we have more, over 17 political parties or 17 political parties who are about to contest, you know. They are all in the, in the vibe of contesting. So you can see that that's an interesting, as Madam Kapata have said, an interesting opportunity for everybody to play their cards and then feel that they can really take the country forward. Um, but that is, it comes along with a lot of fear, again, that um, there might be some uh, funny coalitions that are created that will also scatter the votes of, uh, of, of Gambians. For example, as Madam Batmada was saying, if the APRC are going to coalate with the current president's party, NPP, and they are going to win, that means we might not have any hope of the implementation of the, of the, of the TRC report. And that will scatter the dreams of why even we fight for, for democracy as a, as, a, as a country. So there are, there are numerous challenges, but the opportunities there are, you know, the, the civil society plus the political parties have been, you know, seriously starting the process of elections at a very onset, at the, at the start of the process. We have seen political parties, we have seen um, political party agents, civil society groupings, you know, monitoring the process of the registration. I just came back from Gambia this weekend, uh, last weekend to register because we are not allowed to vote from the diaspora level. So, I have to be there because this political process is very important and very critical for us, I see. Because we as Gambians, um, have, if, we, if we do it right, a lot of countries and a lot of processes will, will definitely follow footsteps of the good things that Gambia has done as a, as a country and they can, it can serve as a learning space. But um, um, the, the political parties and civil society, the reporting that they have been given, given hope, and then the process that will follow as well in terms of ensuring that the election, start, the election process start at the registration center, at the registration level, recording all the malpractices that they feel that are not fair in the process. And we hope that the courts, they call it the reserve revising court, will definitely cancel the registration of people who are not eligible to vote because you know, there is a whole strong rumor of the registration of foreigners, registration of minors in the election process which is also a big concern for, for many Gambians. Again, uh, again, other concerns are, you know, you know, there is kind of a fear or concern around using security uh, in the uh, pledge of, uh, of the government. And that is very worrying because we saw the security uh, police issuing a statement, you know, you know, uh, warning political parties from, from interfering when they are monitoring the process. Uh, I, I, those, those are great concerns for me as a civil society activist, as a civil society person, um, that there might be some police interference. But the hope is the army uh, from last week have announced and told the army, uh, the, the, the military, to stay away from politics. And then the strong warning have given some clear hope that the, the military that have been used by Germany so brutally, so badly, will not hopefully interfere in the process of democracy or elections this time. But you know the vigilance of citizenry is also another hope that we have. Um, the citizens are now very much aware. Majority of governments are very aware, and they know what they want, and they they're gonna put uh, you know the election process 
to the interests of the nation and their own interests. So we hope that it's going to be very competitive election. It's going to be very interesting. And both political parties, civil society, and the government have a, you know, a greater role to ensure that the elections are conducted in a uh, free and fair manner, but also, um, you know, people don't step on each other's rights that will cause chaos and that will, can also cause political instability in the process. So everybody um, in the country is concerned about uh, the security. The country in itself right now is dealing with a lot of security challenges. You know, people have been attacked in their homes. You know, there is a rise, um, rise of you know tax attacking people, robbery, and all of that. So those have all been serious concerns as we go into elections. Again, the, the the economic situation in the country is so bad that certain investments or certain agreements that the government have signed have really deteriorated the livelihood of people. I will call it that way because. Um, We've seen the rise of you know basic commodities, so sky high record. These are things that are very serious concern for me. You know, when people yeah. are seriously living in poverty, you know, they can be bought, they can their, their, their votes, their votes can be bought or can you know can be influenced so badly because yeah. they don't have food on, on the table. So these are all some risks that I that I see the country is going into as as we go very close to the election process. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lamine. Thanks a lot for, you know, retracing some of the points that Our Excellency already mentioned, but also bringing more of the people's perspective, you know, uh, 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 the situation going on with the different political parties, and of course, uh, uh, the, the information you share on the status of Electoral Commission. I mean, before we move to Madi and, 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 and Jawara, uh, uh, there is, I would like to clarify a point. And before I do that, I want to, you know, once again, appreciate all the uh, listeners on, on, on the Zoom platform and those who have also joined us on Facebook. Thank you so much for joining. If you would like to ask any questions to any of the speakers, please kindly drop it in the chat box if you are in the Zoom uh, room with us. And if you're on Facebook, we have our colleague who is also monitoring participation, questions or comments on Facebook, and they will get it into the Zoom platform for us to address them all. So please kindly drop your messages uh, or whatever comment you have into the chat box. We are going to treat them very shortly. Also to state that um, this webinar is being co-organized with Innovation for Change African Hub. So it is with Innovation for Change African Hub, I4C, and the West Africa Civil Society Institute, WAXI, that are both organizing this webinar to discuss the status of democracy in the Gambia, and of course, the role of the non-state actors. So back to you, um, Lamin. Uh, Madam Vice President mentioned that lack of resources was a major challenge that has, uh, you know, made this government to underperform on all the various promises and reforms that the citizens expected. But it's interesting from you, Lamine, to learn that the Electoral Commission is empowered, and I want to believe being empowered also include having adequate resources to facilitate this election. So I really want to go back to Madam Vice President before I we move on to other speaker. So Madam Vice President, can you tell us how ready and how resourced is the Electoral Commission to actually move on with this election? Because I believe that uh, uh, if we do not have the resources to process the different reforms and promises, how and where, and I, I do understand the role that the donors and other partners play in this kind of situation. So Madam Vice President, if you have one or two comments about the resourcefulness of, or, or the resource status of the Electoral Commission, I think it's going to be useful to this gathering and to our listeners, because uh, uh, the tempo and the comments here and there has been that we do not have the resources to do majority of the things we would like to do but do we have the resources to run this election? Otherwise, it may actually be a shock to every one of us. So if you have one or two uh, points for one or two minutes, that's going to be good. And then I will come back to Lamin, then we'll move on. So your excellency, you have the floor now.
please, can you check your mic? Something. Um, can you hear me now? Hello? Hello? Yes, we can hear yes. you. Yes. Okay. So I'm, I'm saying that um, if you, if I, if you must have heard me right, I had said the resource, the resources are not the main factors for the under implementation of the reform agenda. There is also the lack of political will to complete the reform agenda, to enforce the reform agenda. So the resource situation in terms of specifically with the IEC, it took them so many sessions in the national legislature to get the basic that they need for the elections. But um, I wonder whether really this is, a, this is not a, a political uh, 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 strategy, a political uh, ploy uh, not to bring in the diaspora to vote, which is really, really <laughs> what is important. The diaspora played an instrumental role in the democratization of the country. They are still playing a role economically, the foreign and direct investments that they are making in, their, in the country uh, towards GDP and everything is so significant and it's docu well documented. For the, for the IEC, I would have thought that the IEC would have focused the government, the political leadership should have focused more on really uh, adopting a new constitution, which was the aspiration and the inspiration of all Gambians, the voice of the Gambians. This is where number one, this is where I say, I really don't trust the political leadership in really, uh, in terms of resources, resourcing the IEC for elections. This is the fact. I would have said this whether I am in or out, because I'm sure that if, okay. you, look, if you look at my trajectory from the junta to now, I don't stay much in power because of my outspokenness, because I stand for the country. For me, it's Gambia first and something, any other thing last. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So Lamin, just one more minute to one more minute to also respond to that question. But this time I'm, I don't want you to speak about the resources of the IEC or the electoral man management bodies to run the election. I want you to speak about capacity. I, I understand that we are going to this elections with the old constitutions and maybe old characters as well. Do you think the uh, 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 electoral commission possess the capacity to deliver an election that is completely void of Jamaican, uh, And this is the first time. Do you think we have the right things in place, the capacity, and of course the leadership as well to deliver on this election? So uh, I, I would like you to make a comment on that. Then uh, I will invite my colleague Jim to, to, to take on Madi and, and, and uh, Jawara. Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to say that yeah, we have the right, right leadership that have did it before, you know, during Germany when it was very difficult. So I have strong hope that the leadership that is there, when they are properly resourced. So, but I think they have been undermined. Their work has been undermined by okay. limited resourcing. So we cannot avoid talking about resources because um, the IEC is not really funded in a way that they could conduct um, an excellent um, election. So I think they will conduct a better election uh, with the credibility of the, the IEC team. Um, I can also see that the processes that they have already put in place have allowed you know, an open process. But there are loopholes in their process, the IEC processes. I've seen that you know, the aspect of you know, not sticking to the serial uh, attestation you know, uh, giving process. You know, we have seen that people photocopying attestations and giving it to everybody. So will they be able to really, you know, take on everybody who have been illegally registered? Uh, these are all uh, challenges that I that I, have, I, I felt that IEC will be struggling with uh, as come into, in, into the elections. Again, uh, will they be able to have the, the political will throughout the process? It's also a worrying because I see this government as a serious betrayal on all the promises almost that they have made to Gambians. Uh, in, in, its, in the processes. Again, I, the government bluntly, you know, ignored the request from IEC to allow in the diaspora, diaspora voting and, and many, 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 many mm. uh, 
push and pull with government and IEC that have delayed the whole election process of how to tender the materials, uh, to purchase the material that will be that will use for the election process. So these are all challenges that, that, that I see the IEC gonna be struggling with. But with the credibility of the individuals that are there, I have strong hope that they will, they will deliver um, a free and fair elections. Okay, thank you so much, Labin. I think um, the question around having the Gambian diaspora to vote, and of course the process of the electoral process being managed by the IEC itself, I believe these are some of the issues that Madi and, and other colleagues will be speaking to, and how civil society are also participating, how receptive is the leadership towards civil society participation. These are issues that we're going to be addressing. Thank you so much. I have just one comment on the chat box and this person is saying, how free is the electoral commission in the Gambia? Does civil society allow to take part in civic and voters education? We see SO works as electoral observer. I'm sure Mike and Jabara are best in the position to respond to this. So I believe Jim will tackle them when it speaks to them. So Jim, you have the floor now. We can move to the uh, next round. Thank you. Thank you very much, Omolara. And uh, thank you very much, o uh, Honorable and uh, Mohammed. That was uh, very, very insightful contributions there. And I'll just speak on the very optimistic positioning of Mohammed, who said, you know, he's very confident that uh, the Electoral Commission will deliver, you know, in the upcoming elections. And coming to you, um, uh, Madi, just to find out from you, this is uh, an optimism that has been shared by Mohammed and uh, Honorable. Uh, Honorable said these are interesting times in the Gambia. Um, in your view, Madi, how confident are the Gambians, you know, in the electoral process as we approach, you know, December 2021? Madi? Yeah, thank you, Jim. Um, I would say uh, governments are really interested, um, you know, um, engaged with the electoral process, which is now starting with registration of voters. Um, by and large, I would say people are confident that there will be a free and fair election. Uh, but certainly election is a topic that would always have its concerns. Uh, for example, People are concerned about uh, non Gambians voting, I mean, registering, uh, which has been a practice in our elections, and I guess um, in many elections in our region. Um, but also, people are concerned about persons under age getting registered. Um, so, these concerns are there. Um, um, there is the issue of um, we have a system here where if you don't have the uh, required uh, identification like a passport, I mean, I mean, a birth certificate and national ID card, um, and even a passport, yeah, you, you could get an attestation uh, from a village head or a district chief um, you know, to attest that you are born in that uh, location uh, or area. And in the law, this did not cater for banjo, which does not have um, an we call it that person Alcalo, that is the head of a village or town, uh, or a district chief, because Banjo has only a mayor. And apparently, um, uh, the current mayor and uh, previous mayors have given attestation. Um, and so, which is a matter that is now before the courts, because uh, two of our civil society organizations have challenged the legality of the mayor to give attestation. So, all of that shows. Um, the concern, the engagement that citizens, civil society organizations, including political parties, have regarding this election. So um, as civil society, we've deployed um, registration monitors um, uh, around the country. A number of CSOs are doing that. Uh, political parties have their agents also in these registration centers. Uh, sometimes things get contentious um, at, at the registration centers. But all of that to just indicate uh, the huge interest um, of citizens in general uh, about the uh, the election and to ensure that the election is free and fair. Um, I joined Mohammed to say um, I have confidence that the IEC and I see the question in the chat box. Yes, the IEC is independent and uh, CSOs are observing, and I, I am confident that they would um, they are committed to delivering um, 
a free and fair election. Um, we may disagree on the process, on issues within the process, uh, but that would just probably be a matter of opinion, interpretation of the law and things like that. But uh, by and large, I think the IAC, um, I can vouch that uh, the commissioners are not um, you know, there to subvert anything, but to deliver uh, credible elections. And this is what civil society uh, also engaged with, I mean, since the process uh, began. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Madi. That is quite uh, insightful um, um, from you. And I just want to, to, to turn to Hadija, you know, uh, given that I'm sure you must have been scanning the media landscape as we walk uh, gradually towards December 4. Um, Hadija, what, what, what's the temperature like, you know, from citizens' perspectives, you know, with regards to these uh, coming elections? What is the momentum like from a citizen's perspective? What are your appreciations, observations, and analysis of the situation so far, Hadija? Uh, thank you very much, Jim. I think the previous speakers uh, mentioned that people are really excited about the upcoming election. So this is the first time in more than 22 years we are having a free and democratic elections where uh, all the political parties are starting in the right footing. And for the first time, I can say, I think my colleagues can attest to this, that you see young people really excited about the elections. Uh, uh, most of them are posting online that they have registered to vote. And then you can see even the first week of voting, most of the polling stations uh, registration stations were jam-packed. So I'm very excited about it, uh, and um, we are very hopeful about it. I think one point Mari failed to uh, mention also is that uh, the civil society also is doing a lot of campaign to make sure that people go out and register. And I think they, are, they have a concert coming up called the Rock the Vote concert, where they are encouraging the young people to go to the concert with top Gambian artists with their voters' cards. So it's actually very exciting to watch. and. We are, uh, uh, logistics aside, we do have some shortcomings here and there, but uh, the good thing about it is that um, even though I'm a young person, I've never seen young people this excited about an upcoming election. So that's kind of very hopeful. And I think it's a good thing also because it, we see that for the past few years, uh, young people are more engaged in our political dialogue and when it comes to political participation. And it's good to see that they want to take part to have a voice uh, before you hardly see them even commenting or debating about issues. They tend to focus on other things, maybe football and music and everything. And these changes, we are really excited about it. And we want, we hope so. The momentum continues and then we see more youth participation. And I hope it goes also to the National Assembly election where we'll have more young people taking part in the political process of the country. Thank you. That, that really makes me now to have a very vivid picture of what Honorable described as an interesting time in the, in the Gambia. And, and still with you, Adija, you know, um, when we look at across West Africa, there are instances prior to elections that in some countries there are these um, tendencies of clamping down on, on the opposition, and such tendencies tend to create fear, you know, in the citizens or in the entire uh, electoral process. Now, given your observations in the country and your understanding of the situation, what is the pre-election environment like in the country, particularly with regards to security, with regards to um, the enabling environment for all actors to freely and willfully participate in every endeavor to make these upcoming elections a success. What's the pre-election environment like? When it comes to political, I think uh, the security, I will try to break it into two contexts uh, because we do have security issues right now and we have to be honest about that. Uh, we have an, uh, issues of crime rate going up right now and people actually fearful of their life. That can affect people's decision-making processes too. But when you look at it on the other side also, when it comes to the opposition's uh, political participation and everything, we have not seen uh, government directly going to the opposition, attacking them and everything. But we do have, we have also seen some cases where uh, journalists or uh, one or two political leaders, that was two years ago, where, when they were called into question. But I think the uproar from the citizens kind of uh, make the government to backtrack. But, but then we do have security issues. Uh, but when it comes to the political participation or the election, I can I won't say that I have seen the government directly trying to attack the opposition's leaders or clamp down on them or when it comes to their campaigns or their debates and everything. 
But uh, for the crime rate, uh, there is a big, uh, this, because the security sector reform, I think uh, the Honorable mentioned that earlier, she didn't go into details that much, because we wanted to have some reforms when it comes to reforming the military, the police and everything, so that, because we had, they, their mindset before, during the dictatorship was there. They tend to be very aggressive, they committed a lot of crimes and everything. So one of the uh, coalition agenda was that the security sector should be reformed so that uh, they can be trained on human rights issues also. And then you have, because you have a lot of people who are not supposed to be in the security, in the security also. And then you have the tribal elements there where people are, where are promoted based on their uh, uh, different settings of groups and everything. So those reform, one of the biggest disappointments of this government didn't actually didn't take place. So you have issues in the military, in the police and all those things going on. And then you have a uh, rise in crime in the Gambia. Uh, currently, because uh, every day we get up, you hear a lot of uh, violent crimes being reported in the media or across social media pages. So we are actually worried about this because uh, normally Gambia is a peaceful country. This is, this is what we sell when it comes to our tourism, our economy, uh, our investors. This is what we sell to the people. It's a very free country and everything. So we have that concern going on and nothing actually being done about that. So and that's actually a very big problem for us right now. Uh, th thank you very much for, for that. Maria, I come back to you, and given that you've been in the space for decades now, um, working on diverse issues, but particularly in your country, you've been at the forefront of ensuring that democracy wins. And from the previous elections in the country, what do you think the elections managing body needs to do you know, to improve on its practice to ensure that the upcoming elections are described as free, fair, and credible to the satisfaction of Gambians and why not West Africans and Africans at large. Madi? Uh, thank you, Jim. Um, yeah, I think uh, what the IEC, we call it IEC here, Independent Electoral Commission, um, needs to improve on its communications. Um, you know, to give updates to um, citizens and, you know, all stakeholders on a periodic basis. In the normal circumstances, I would have said a weekly press briefing um, to update on the state of affairs regarding the registration. Um, it also means um, the commission needs to build its capacity from inside. For example, um, uh, um, having its own internal legal department, um, which I raised uh, just a few days ago when we had a civil society um, consultation with them, um, to, so that they are given legal advice um, on the issues that would emerge. Um, uh, and in addition to that, to create its own, you know, monitoring mechanisms and other, you know, capacities, um, so that. Uh, they can further improve the management of elections. All of this is necessary simply because um, elections is not just merely voting day. Um, election is also um, a, a political issue, it's a social issue, it's an economic issue. And so elections therefore borders hugely on national security. And so we've seen election therefore become a source of conflict, but at the same time, a source for peace building. Uh, um, across the world. In the Gambia itself, 2016, we saw how election nearly became a source of conflict. I mean, it, it, it created a conflict already, um, which was peacefully resolved. Um, but even in advanced democracies, I mean, we see the uh, 2020 election in the United States, um, you know, where um, one of the candidates, Donald Trump, refused the, re I mean, the results. And we saw what happened, uh, you know, um, with the attack on Congress. Uh, by his supporters. So that tells us that uh, elections can make or break a society. So which means uh, the referee in this game, which is the electoral body, uh, needs to do everything it can to um, obtain and maintain uh, the trust and the confidence of electoral stakeholders. Um, that is non-negotiable. And in this election here in the Gambia, um, you know, we've had comments from even uh, from political parties, um, you know, raising concerns, um, issues uh, around the electoral commission. And, um, you know, all of that means um, the electoral body needs to um, really 
uh, engage in a lot of consultation, a lot of information sharing in full on time. Um, you know, and I can give one or two examples. For example, the voter registration was supposed to begin, you know, sometime earlier than today. Uh, but all of a sudden, there was an announcement that uh, it has been uh, deferred or postponed uh, because there are some other issues the IEC had to address, basically about you know the procurement of election materials, and you know that raised a lot of speculations. And one thing an electoral body doesn't want is uh, citizens, stakeholders like political parties, to speculate about you and speculate in a negative way um, to to create you know conspiracy theories around you. Um, and I think over time it's been proven that there were no ulterior motives uh, in the Electoral Commission, but really, I mean, they had just faced some administrative um, issues that must be addressed, you know. Um, and of course, I mentioned this issue of attestation, uh, which you can see um, various parties standing on different sides, even within the civil society, uh, people are divided as to really, uh, can the mayor give attestation or can she not give attestation? So all of these are issues that um, with that capacity insight, that legal capacity, but that also uh, communications would have helped uh, to allay fears. And there are other uh, instruments within the electoral system. For example, we have inter-party committee, which is sort of like an association of political parties, uh, which was closely with the IEC. So it is a matter of how you know, urgently, you know, on time, you know, engage those kinds of bodies uh, just to make sure uh, you control the narrative and, you know, you address all concerns and fears. So if, if there are anything, I mean, uh, to advise, I mean, these are uh, what I would advise uh, the actual body to, uh, to, to do to equip itself. itself. Um, you know, with, of course, uh, with all the um, experience that, that they, they've had over the years. Thank you very much, Madi. And I don't know if you can lean on your experience from across the region, you know, from practices or the work of similar institutions in other countries, Ghana, Nigeria, you know, you, you can identify one or two better, should I say, democratic uh, uh, institutions or bodies or countries that the Gambia can lean from. Do you think there are some uh, practices that the IEC can learn from other countries to strengthen the process and build credibility in the efforts that it's putting in place to ensure that the upcoming elections are described as worthy? Yeah, I think um, very close is Senegal um, and also um, Ghana, even though Senegal, um, you know, does not have like a, a body like we have, uh, it, it is still more or less a government institution. But then, um, you know, the extent to which they have exercised their independence, um, uh, not just exercise or independence, because it's one thing to have independence, uh, the other thing is to have um, to capacity. And, you know, um, you know, so both Senegal and, and Ghana offers um, you know, good examples or, you know, benchmarks for which uh, would benefit, benefit the Gambia a lot. Um, but, you know, I, I think one must also say um, over the period, our actual body had sought engagements with a, a wide range of actors, uh, not just in the region, but, you know, I mean, sub-region, but even within the region of Africa, but as well um, uh, to the rest of the world. Um, uh, to the point that I think uh, the requisite um, capacity in terms of you know generally conducting elections is there. I think what would be required is to build specific um, you know specialty in specific areas, like I said, in terms of uh, legal advice, uh, in terms of communications, you know, uh, in terms of monitoring. Um, how do you build these specific um, you know um, capacities capabilities? to be able to do this um, because the advantage we have in, in the Gambia also is the, the smallness of the size of, I mean of, of the electoral uh, list you know the voter registration I mean voter list is, is pretty small at most is a million people uh, a largely small country um, you know of, of flat easy to access and, and so on so uh, to a large extent there are enough of so opportunities advantages available to them to manage this and certainly um, you know we've seen uh, the uh, some sort of stability within the, uh, the commission 
so that the commissioners there, uh, most of them have been in place for the past 14 years. So they, they have gone through a number of elections uh, to be able to learn from lessons and so on. Um, yes, we had a difficult moment uh, I mean, uh, during the period of the dictatorship, but you know, we, it's still the, the same team, more or less, that's been running elections. And um, a lot of the issues that I imagine are, are definitely not new. You know, um, they, they are not new at all. And so um, what for me therefore uh, should be done is, uh, you know, increase the level of consultation, increase the level of communications, you know, get capacity in certain specific, you know, areas. And, and uh, certainly we should be able to, to, to do this um, efficiently and effectively. Amazing, amazing. And I'll come back to the, the other panelists. Um, Honorable raised something that is quite critical. And I think with your insights, it will be useful to share some recommendations that um, could trigger a positive action in that regard by the EIEC. And uh, Honorable actually highlighted uh, that ongoing efforts may limit the effective participation of the Gambians in the diaspora. Uh, in the upcoming elections. And uh, from where you sit, and maybe I can begin with you, Lamin, what do you think the, the IEC should do and do speedily? Because we are in June, the election, in fact, July is uh, some days away, and uh, the elections are coming up, you know, in December. So what must the IEC do now to ensure that the diasporans, you know, can equally have their say in this very important process uh, in the life of the country. Lamin? Unfortunately, um, I think they have lost, they have dropped the ball in that regard. <laughs> there, is no, there is nothing that can be done. Um, the minister went to the parliament and told the parliamentarians that they cannot, they, can, they don't have money to put in a supplementary bill um, for the diasporans to have, to, for IC to have money to be able to register the diasporans. I listened to one of the parliamentarians recently who said that uh, the parliamentarian from, from the North Bank region, Suleiman, uh, said that you know nothing can be done to turn this around. Unfortunately, they do not have the political will or the government support to have the diasporans to participate in the process. Um, one has been st stating that maybe the government, the current government fears that if diasporans participate in the election process, they might not be in, in their favor. But you know that that is a kind of a rumor. But um, unfortunately, funding is the major challenge, and some speculate that technical challenges are also there. Like the technical expertise of registering diasporas um, will will hinder the process. And as we talk now, they are not in the plans of the IEC to uh, to conduct uh, to participate in the election. So they will just spectators, and those who can pop into Gambia will will, will obviously uh, participate. Oh, that is, that is um, quite pathetic to note um, 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 in this regard. And, you know, I'm just asking myself, you know, given such a situation, you know, it may really keep the, 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 the Gambians in the diaspora highly disappointed. Um, but we hope that learning from this, the resources will be pulled, you know, in the future to ensure that the, the right mechanisms or the right infrastructure is put in place to accommodate, accommodate them. Um, I, I, I would like to get the perspectives of all our panelists on, you know, the role of regional civil society. You know, the Gambia is not working in silos. The Gambia is a member of the ECOWAS, is a sister to neighboring Senegal, to the, the Nigeria, Sierra Leone. You know, we are in this community of people of goodwill, and particularly within the civil society body, we like to collaborate at the national level, at the regional level. And so from your view, how do you think, or what role can civil society across the region support the Gambia, you know, to ensure that, you know, the gains of democracy that we've achieved are consolidated through the upcoming uh, electoral process that is coming up? Uh, maybe we'll begin with you. Uh, Lamin, and then we take Honorable, and then we come to the other panelists. Your take on that, Lamin. Thank you so much, uh, Jim. That's a very good question. I think the civil society on the continent, and especially in the sub-region, have a critical role to play in the process. Um, they have to guide and safeguard the process that they have supported from the beginning. 
of helping Gambia to remove themselves out of Gambians to remove themselves out of the process of the uh, dictatorship. I think now is the journey need to continue. The civil service should not just be uh, pick pointing or choosing or acting and later dropping the ball. They need to continue the journey because democracy in itself is a whole cycle, it's a whole process, and then that's how the civil society need to act. So I see you call them Gambia project as uh, what civil call it, and others will call it also Gambia project. I think that those projects need to need to be transformed into a program, and they need to work with uh, the civil society groupings in the Gambia to see how they can support the, I think the process should even start now, you know, monitoring the voter registration that the civil society in the, out, of the, out of the Gambia have actually failed to do. I think the process should have started right from there, the voter registration, because election processes start from voter registration. Then they move into, you know, the process of monitoring the campaigns. They move into process of supporting and monitoring the election in itself. These are, these are, these are things that I think the, the civil society need to do. Again, the civil society in Gambia are really struggling with funding. So the civil society outside need to be able to help mobilize funds so that the civil society in Gambia can, can really go out there and, and really do the work that they need to do. I will tell you, they, the civil society in Gambia have really been trying, but they are limited with funding. The, 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 the actual monitoring system right now, they, they have about, I think, 15, 50 polling stations or not less than 100 polling stations out of thousands of uh, police, they are out of thousands of registration centers. So that can show you how limited um, the capacity is and how limited the resources are. So um, that, that Pan-African solidarity for democracy is what is what is needed. We we need to support um, uh, civil society. Need to support Gambians to be able to safeguard and protect the democracy that everyone has yet to support. Because Gambia would have been or could be a sample that others can copy from um, in terms of uh, improving democracy in their countries. So civil society outside, uh, their solidarity is critical and need to be on now. The time is now. Uh, and I'm sure our colleague, uh, Guy Christian from Gabon, Messi Guy Christian Detra Vec no Sumatan. I'm sure our colleague, Guy Christian from Gabon, will definitely take that message um, across to his peers in the country to show as much solidarity to, to Gambian civil society as we march on to the upcoming elections. Honorable, please, can you turn on your mic and uh, share one or two insights as to how civil society across the region can show some solidarity, show some support at this interesting time, you know, in the in the trajectory of uh, the democratic process in the country. Yes, uh, but before I do, there is a question about the independence of the IEC. Question on judiciary has become since it was largely under the influence of the government on the JAMI. I think it needs to be answered. It has been answered, but not directly. Um, there is the independence of the, uh, the IEC. And uh, in terms of uh, your question, uh, saying what other regional countries can bring for, to Gambia, I would think that Gambia is a model. It's not nothing, no institution is perfect, but in terms of experience, exp expertise, the, the IEC, Gambian IEC is really one that really needs to be uh, taken pride of. Um, just as Madi was saying, all they need is to have the required resources, to have the required uh, capacity in specialized agencies. And I would rather think that also uh, efforts should be made towards uh, strengthening the inter-party committee, which is a committee that's really like a conduit to ensure that uh, there is open and fair uh, democratic elections uh, in the Gambia. In terms of support of civil society in the region, there are so many opportunities. Uh, but first of all, in our, there is um, an analog in, a, in, in Gambia in our language that uh, you need to help yourself before other people help you. Demo the civil society that is Gambian uh, and grown in Gambia and so forth needs uh, the capacity, they need resources uh, to be able to have in terms of logistics. Because right now I have been to some of the pooling the registration uh, stations, and I, 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 I couldn't, I haven't found a, a strong, really, visibility of any civil society agent there, which is very critical. It is now that they should start being engaged, ensuring that people underaged are not uh, registered, uh, non Gambians are not registered. So they need that uh, adequate resources. They need to institutionalize uh, themselves in terms of um, civil society, and they also need to work because the civil society in Gambia is fragmented, is truncated, 
you have the Tango, which is a model. It's a very good institution. It has done quite a lot of work in terms of civil society uh, uh, in engagement in politics and social and, and development. But uh, the Tango needs to really also uh, strengthen its institution, its capacity to be able to really bring Ghana, all civil societies under one umbrella, uh, ensure that they are strengthened and they have access to the engagement, political engagement. But then after that, the local level or national level, you can have so many African civil societies are interested in the Gambia. Gambia is a role model. Um, it's a young lady, it's like a young lady, 18 year old, beautiful, standing out in all, in all uh, dimension, intelligence, uh, educated and whatever. And every man coming towards, uh, you know, everybody liking to be uh, uh, going towards the lady, either as a, an inspiration, as model, or as a future leader or whatever. So that lady should really be nurtured. The democracy that we have needs to be nurtured. And as I, I joined the other speakers to say that democracy is not, it's not a one-time uh, thing. It is a, it is a, it's a process. And elections is not an indicator of democracy. Free and fair elections is not, and it's just the beginning is the key to democracy, where people can be, their voices can be heard and, and so forth. So the African region is very interested. You have very strong civil society. You have Guy, as you say, now Christian Musabu, bonjour, Musa Guy, uh, who has joined us. We are proud that he is interested in this topic on our country. And I think that as you rightly said, uh, he will send the message, uh, not only to Gabon, to wherever his network is. And I would also like uh, to recommend, of course, you are doing it, but also to underscore that what is doing a, a, a critical, is playing an instrumental role in terms of mobilizing civil society to get engaged in the region, because it's only Africa that can really take care of its problems. So before we put in out or we bring in other international partners, once they see civil society is strong, then uh, definitely other parties would just be would just uh, be facilitators rather than being in the driver's seat in making uh, democracy work for the Gambia and for the sub-region and, and for the region as a whole. Thank you very much, Honorable. There is another question that requires your attention. It's actually directed um, to you. I'll try to frame it. Um, um, it is from Thomas Robert. Thomas Robert, thanks for dropping this in. And, and it says, when you were in office as the vice president, did you prioritize an overall constitutional reform and how? And uh, he goes further to say, um, actions that were taken, it is believed, observers believe that one of the first actions that government took at the time that you were in office was to change the, the constitution, you know, to suit itself. And this left many Gambians unhappy. And one of the panelists today uh, in his article, Madi says, um, this action by the new government raises concern about its sincerity and commitment to system change and the integrity and credibility of any future constitutional reform process. It is perplexing to note uh, certain piecemeal amends, amendments being undertaken as if a new constitution would not be uh, coming. So that is actually a justification to the perceived um, um, actions by the government at the time, you know, to push for a constitutional review that partly suits them. But so in your, in your, in your, how would you respond to that, Madam VP, particularly with, within the context of how such actions could impact on, you know, the upcoming elections that we are looking forward to? First of all, I would like to uh, reiterate uh, uh, my viewpoint and clarification, which can be verified uh, that when I was in government, I was totally against the piecemeal amendment of the constitution. People direct that question to me directly and in disguise, simply because they feel I influenced it. I am a Democrat. I'm an honest person. I stand for my country. I stand for what is right. 
I am not going to my grave with anybody. I'm going alone to my grave. So I'm looking at what is going to, what God is going to ask me. The reason why I left my job as a, as a UN to join my country is to join the struggle and do the little I could. And I'm happy that I did that. And I stood for the, uh, the comprehensive constitutional review. I stood for it. His Excellency, the president, this is going to be, it's out in the social media. I'm speaking to the world today. He can attest to it that so many times we have had discussions about the necessity of having a comprehensive constitutional review and adopt the constitution in a participatory manner so that we move the country into a third republic. That would have been a great legacy for the government, whether I am in or out. And I can say that I'm still part of government because I'm still chairing the, co the coalition 2016. And I'm there as a voice, not only for, the co for, the, for any political party, but for the country. The coalition is there for the country. Now, the reason why we couldn't have the constitutional review when I was there was the fact that we did not have money. And uh, you can ask the, the, the government right now, including the political leadership. I went out of my way to mobilize funding from the UN system, from the EU, just to get the, at least the priority reform program like constitutional review, security review, uh, civil society review, so, I mean, uh, civil uh, service review. Because I was the minister responsible for overseeing the, the, the civil service reform. And we, I submitted cabinet papers, everything, including the, the, the repealing of the, of the bill on, on, um, on uh, pension. For, the, for our pension was there, the Pension Act dated 1950. When I went, my first thing as a development practitioner, as a politician, as somebody who was there not to just replace, uh, fill a position, I tried my best to use my expertise. And as person in charge of government business, I tried to do my best for us to have the constitution, the reform, um, the reform process uh, completed within the time frame if we had the resources. So the, I, I, am, I stand very tall and very happy that I have never and will never be compromised in any way or form. When it, when it concerns me, it concerns my family or my friends or community or whatever, to have Gambia really uh, stoop down or disappoint her citizens because of any individualism. I am still here, out and spoken. I was removed for political reasons. Everybody knows that it's not because I created any, I violated any constitution or violated any policy or whatever, or for dishonesty or for corruption. I was removed for political reasons, but I still see myself as relevant, as active, as an honest to my country. I'm accountable to my country. I'm not accountable to anybody. And that's why I swore on the Holy Quran to be part and parcel of the coalition government. So whoever is asking the question, I hope this is once and for all clear that it was not amended because of my age or whatever. It was and actually the amendment, I should also clarify, was not only for my age. It was also amended to accommodate the, uh, the commission, the legal, legal practitioners who were on the commission uh, looking into the uh, uh, the assets of uh, Jame, former president Jame, uh, Jame and his associates. So I totally disagreed. I was uh, really, and so many times should I say, because I'm not speaking to the world, that I've engaged His Excellency, the President Adam Abaru many times to say that the repealing of the constitution because of my age was something I was not comfortable with and that it should be dropped. And I did even recommended certain names to him to be appointed as vice president, including the present vice president of this country. So for me, I can sleep and I, I sleep peacefully. And I want to stand and live and die as an honest Gambian that doesn't owe anything to, uh, to her country, 
Rather, if anything, the country has done everything for me and I will continue to stand for my country until the day I will be put in my, in my grave. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very passionate uh, uh, clarification uh, um, that you shared there. And it's quite um, interesting to, 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 to see how you expressed you know, your, your stand for processes that are in the interest of the, the Gambians. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, also we have a comment. Uh, salute to you, Madam Honor Honorable uh, Fatumata. That is from Stigmata Tenga. Um, Africa's challenges require African solutions. I think it's from the previous uh, submission that you shared um, with us. Uh, thanks to everyone watching. Madia, I will be coming back to you shortly because um, you, you, you are a voice, you know, a strong voice, a pillar in the civil society space across West Africa. And how do you think civil society across the region can support civil society in the Gambia during this very important uh, moment in the life of the country as we move, as we look forward to the upcoming elections? Madi? Yeah, thank you, um, Jim. Um, you know, the Gambia should be seen as a sub-regional project. Um, which starts with ECOWAS uh, to the governments in the region and to the civil society. Uh, in 2016, I, I remember having um, consultations with um, Waxi, you know, uh, with Waxoff and, you know, um, with Congard in Senegal, uh, with Spong in Burkina Faso, uh, with NNGO in Nigeria, and so on. Uh, all of who made statements um, to condemn the former president uh, for rejecting the results and calling on him to step down. And, you know, um, the government civil society has been struggling during the period of leadership, but we've always, uh, you know, sought to engage in the sub region. So that when we get to this point, um, the, the Gambian civil society, whatever success we claim, or whatever efforts in the cities were uh, undertaken, uh, is actually um, in, in, in collaboration, in, in partnership, in, you know, in sync with what the rest of the civil society is doing in, in the sub-region. Um, some of us who are engaged in these things know this. So um, what the uh, civil society in West Africa needs to be doing is, first of all, uh, to hold ECOWAS accountable. And that is very important because uh, the role ECOWAS played in the Gambian situation, but also because of the overall function of ECOWAS in our sub-region. And particularly when we look at the sub-region, uh, the situation in Mali, uh, what we went through in Guinea, Guinea Conakry and Guinea um, and, and Ivory Coast in terms of time limits. Uh, but even when we look at Senegal, when, you know, 2012 with Ablai Wad and uh, Guinea-Bissau as well, you know, of course, we can't forget about Togo um, and Niger earlier before that. So given all of these things, what all of these shows is, the, the sub-region uh, needs to have stability and democratic stability for that matter. And you know, for that to happen, uh, it is important that ECOWAS um, you know, um, step up, all right? ECOWAS need to step up. And so the, the various networks we have within the sub-region, um, uh, of course, under the auspices of workshop as well and individual organizations need to ensure that really uh, democratic ideals, principles prevail um, throughout the sub-region. And so when we have a case like the Gambia, which for me sh should have been, you know, a case that should be emulated, I mean, across for having removed a dictatorship, um, you know, on the back of elections, uh, to create a, a, a truly uh, modern democracy, even though I know we have, um, you know, could have, I mean, um, a KVAT, you know, which is probably the most, uh, stable democracy we've, we've had, um, Ghana and you know, Senegal. But then to make sure um, you know, we, we have that stable democracy in the Gambia that by making sure ECOWAS holds the Gambia government accountable uh, to what was agreed in 2016, which unfortunately, as uh, Mod Lamin uh, highlighted, was severely betrayed uh, to the point that today, the situation in the Gambia um, you know, is, is nothing to be proud of. You know, and so um, what I would therefore uh, suggest that the civil society in West Africa do um, is that engagement with ECOWAS so that ECOWAS um, would take a, a strong stance 
to, to ensure that, you know, I mean, of course, Gambia is an independent sovereign country. So to an extent, you have a limitation as to, you know, what you can make the government agree to or not, but to uh, at the same time, remind the Gambia government of its obligations. The reason why the progress that we should have registered, whether it's constitutional reform or security sector reform or legal reforms, uh, institutional reforms, um, is largely because uh, we have a government that has reneged on all the commitments that we made in 2016 uh, and 2017. So um, ECOWAS invested huge amount of resources uh, into this issue. And of course, our other development partners, until today, we have economic forces are stationed in the Gambia. So all of these indicate that indeed the, the uh, sub-region, the civil society in the sub-region need to take the Gambia case as, you know, a, a case in, I mean, uh, uh, which I was, as an institutional matter, as an organizational matter, to, to make sure we deliver a model, we deliver a success uh, that, um, you know, that all of us would be proud of and would be, uh, uh, you know, as everyone to emulate, uh, not only in West Africa, but the whole of I mean, Africa. So that aside, of course, uh, one can speak to the issue of capacity. Um, you know, Mohammed raised that issue. Uh, it's not only resources, but skills. We got to remember that uh, the history and the experience of government society is such that it did not have that enough experience to be engaged in advocacy and activism, as we see in Nigeria, in Ghana, in Senegal, in Burkina Faso, I mean, and across other countries in the region. We did not have that expertise and experience. Tango was formed in 1983, mainly by you know, international uh, NGOs in the Gambia doing charity work. So Gambian civil society, Gambian-based organizations, one can say began to emerge from the late 80s to the early 90s and into the period that we were in a dictatorship. And the focus was mainly on service provision, addressing the needs of the people. So the idea of policy engagement, the idea of influencing public policy, you know, holding government accountable, advocacy work, activism work for democracy, human rights, is something that was not in the uh, DNA of government civil society in the way they emerged. So that by the time the dictator became fully, I mean, fledged, uh, government civil society found itself quite um, unable to respond to what was happening in the Gambia. We've been meeting in Ghana, in Senegal, in places. They say, but what is government civil society doing? Why are you not doing this? But you know, the experience was in there. So that by 2012, when Tango began to actively engage on these issues through policy dialogues, it was even difficult. So which means uh, government civil society needs a lot of capacity as well as resources, but it needs a lot of capacity, a lot of mentoring, it needs a lot of guidance from the rest of the region. And we've sought to build those relationships, I mean, until now. So I think uh, uh, to your question, therefore, what I would say, uh, our civil society in the sub-region, um, you know, at, at, at the level of the Gambia, I mean, at the political level, need to uh, understand that the issue is not WACC or WACSOF or Congard or SPONG or anyone coming down to Gambia to, to act, uh, to make things work in the Gambia, work through ECOWAS to hold ECOWAS to its commitments to the Gambia. That is number one. And number two, engage with Gambian organizations inside the country to help build their capacity in advocacy and activism. Because ultimately, and, and that is not just Gambia or here in the sub-region, but across the world, in the history of the world, um, that is what civil society does, activism and advocacy. And that is what sustains democracy, whether it's in the United States or Sweden or France, this is what we see civil society do. And certainly it, it has to be the same. Gambia is no different. I mean, West Africa is no different. We've seen what civil society is doing in, 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 in all of those countries, from Nigeria down to Kiva. They, they don't just sit uh, across the table with political leaders just to talk. Yes, they talk, but um, we also engage. And one good thing that is emerging in Gambian society now, uh, which uh, in the past, it was only the Gambia Press Union that was doing that, was to engage in strategic litigation. So over the past uh, six months, we've seen, seen civil society actors in the Gambia and those in the Gambian diaspora uh, go to the Supreme Court at least three times. You know, so I, I think uh, that, that it, you know, it's a very uh, significant development uh, within the civil society. And of course, within the broader framework of the fact that the Gambian civil society is, uh, is seeking, as we speak right now, to reposition itself, to restructure itself, to rebrand itself in order to engage more meaningfully. Because um, as I said, I think we are in very critical times. 
the Truth Commission is, is submitting its uh, final re report um, in, in the first week or second week of July. If anything to learn is to say that that report, especially its recommendations, will not be implemented in full or would be done selectively because we've seen other commissions, uh, what has happened. We've seen this president renege on fundamental promises. So, um, and, and, and when this government uh, downplays, um, you know, engages or implements, you know, the uh, truth commission recommendations with that, you know, objective of political expediency, uh, it is a threat to national security because the country right now is severely polarized along political party lines, along tribal lines, and there's a whole uh, polarization regarding the dictatorship and you know the, the current dispensation or the truth commission that the, the former president's party, APRC, is hell-bent on uh, demonizing, on discrediting uh, the, the truth commission, the transfer justice process as a whole. So uh, um, we have a whole community of victims who you know are disillusioned as we speak right now. I mean, are not confident that this government is going to, um, you know, implement these recommendations. So, what is going to happen, you know, if this present president now is um, seeking to align with the uh, APRC, then effectively we are not going to see recommendations being implemented, and that is a potential cause for concern, you know, in terms of national security, in terms of peace and stability. So, um, our civil society in this subregion, therefore, uh, needs huge engagement with the government civil society at home. But again, as I said, uh, let them engage at the level of ECOWAS, but also particularly in countries like Senegal and Ghana, all right, to engage with their governments. So we, I would expect Senegalese uh, CSOs, Ghanaian CSOs, um, you know, CSOs in Nigeria, simply because of their influence, their relationship, you know, with the Gambia uh, in the context of the subregion to engage, to uh, put pressure on their governments, to put pressure on the Gambia government, to you know, uphold um, you know, its promises to uphold the ideals of democracy and good governance and the rule of law. Thank you very much, Madi. And those are very um, um, concrete recommendations shared there. And I hope um, our, our, our viewers um, will take this up. Uh, you know, participants who are in these respective countries um, from across the region will take this up. You know, to make sure that you know that solidarity um, cross border cross institutional is actually given to ensure that civil society in the Gambia is not left alone. Thank you very much, participants. We are following the feedback that you're sharing um, in the chat. Chat, chat room, please keep them coming. There is a Google sheet that has been shared there for you to share with us some honest feedback about this ongoing um, um, discussion. So please feel free to click on it um, and share your feedback. Adija, I will be coming to you because you work within a very unique space within the civil society body, and that is the, with, with, with the media um, actors across the, the, the region. And you, know, you understand their way of working, their interests, what they will likely consider as priorities. In your view, Adija, how will you, or how do you think the media across the region can show solidarity or can support civil society in the Gambia, you know, as they make efforts to contribute to ensure that we have smooth elections in December? Hadija? Uh, thank you, G. This is something I actually always love working on because we have seen at the press union level, we have registered a lot of success with collaborating with other media organizations across the West Africa region. And I think the perfect example is one in Ghana, Media Foundation for West Africa. And then we actually work with media rights agenda also from Nigeria when the transition period uh, came in. Because uh, what we did was we came up with some strategic priorities together. We sat across the table and say that uh, how can Media Foundation from Ghana and then how can Media Rights Agenda from Nigeria help the Gambia's media reforms agenda in the country? And we got a lot of uh, help from them. And like Madi ex uh, explained earlier, with civil society in the Gambia during the German regime was very, very weak. And we realized that we need some technical support from these organizations. And I, I can happily say that they help us in our drafting of the uh, access to information bill and also some of the media reforms priorities we had because what uh, what we end up doing is that we came up with a strategic document and we mobilized funds together. We were able to get the funds and then we worked together as a team with other civil society actors in the country to to 
push for these reforms. And I'm happy to say that most of the things we were working on, more than 50% of them, we succeeded because currently uh, the access to information bill is in parliament. They may uh, is actually going for vote in uh, July. And we are very hopeful that the parliament will vote for that bill. And also some of the cases also, we took it to the Supreme Court and won most of them. We, I think we only have two cases. Uh, uh, we, we actually lost only two cases. We submitted the, our position to get our position paper on media reforms uh, for the Constitutional Review Commission together. And this was done through collaboration with other actors uh, across the region. So this is something I personally believe in and I've seen that it can work. Uh, it's actually based on how do you, uh, uh, when you sit at the table, what are some of the discussion? You, because you need to have honest discussion. What are the roles of each of the actors or what are, what are the roles of each of the teams and agenda and what are some of the areas you are going to work on? How can you work on it? Because it always helps to work together as a team because it's when you, when, I think when you are presenting something and when people look at the papers or some of the reforms you are coming out with and they see different actors there, uh, they take you seriously because I, I realize that most of the time when we go for negotiations with most of our donor partners or some of government officials also, when they look across the table and they've seen that we have different actors from different regions of the, uh, across Africa also, they tend to take you seriously because they know that this is a very serious thing and then uh, they are ready to work with. So these are some of the things I actually believe when it comes to collaboration, it can work very well. And when it comes to media, media has always been very, very supportive. Uh, Especially we, when we are coming to elections also, because it's easier. Uh, we have seen that media organizations now are more organized when it comes to investigation, when it comes to sharing news report and everything. We talk to each other more. We share information more. So when it comes to partnering, it actually, it always works very well for us. And, uh, coming to this election, I will hope to see those partnerships again across the region from our colleagues in different countries. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very, very much. And before I invite my colleague Omolara, um, just to uh, draw our attention to this uh, regional platform that collates information on uh, electoral practices across the region. It's called the Electoral Integrity Portal, www.eliwa.org. It is, uh, it's been shared on the chat. You as a citizen, wherever you are, you know, you can create your account and you can share updates on what is happening in your country vis-a-vis -vis, um, um, the democratic process in your country. Uh, Omolara, are you there, please? Great. Yes. So before, great. So um, I, I just want to, to, to leave you. Um, with, with, with our panelists as we are wrapping up, up soon. So please, you have the floor. Okay. Thank you so much, Jim. And thank you, Your Excellency, for sharing those passionate uh, 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 and, of, of course, personal uh, experiences and insights inside with us. And we really appreciate your, your sincerity and uh, uh, the details that you have shared. Uh, we do respond this webinar and also to my colleagues Lamine, uh, uh, Jawara and, and, and Madi, thank you for, for also sharing your own perspective with us. Maybe one thing, one thing Madi, uh, uh, and I would like Madi to respond to this. Uh, I do know, and I'm sure you will acknowledge that um, uh, ECOWAS, you did acknowledge that ECOWAS was quite instrumental in where we are you know, the, the much progress we have made in the Gambia way before 2016. And of course, from 2016, uh, one particular example that the commission uh, 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 made uh, that I, I would like to recall is the, con uh, the constitution of uh, what we call the ECOMIC, the constitution of ECOMIC as a sort of buffer, security buffer for situ situation in the Gambia as a day. I would like you, and of course, in this conversation, we have been talking about the need for security reform, legal, constitutional, and institutional reforms, which were part of the primary agenda for this regime, and uh, uh, not following those reforms due to so many challenges has actually limited the progress that we have made on the Gambia project. But I, I, uh, I want to ask, amidst all the feedback that you have all given regarding to the current security situation in the country, how is ECOMIG 
responding or helping the Gambians and of course this government to respond to this security challenges because I, I I'm not sure of the the details of their mandate but I do know of course missions like that are to offer security you know support protection of also can you speak about the role of economic in the Gambia now and if that in any way could you know serve as a buffer to these security gaps that we are facing Madi what do what, what are your thoughts Okay, thank you. Um, now, Afrobarometer has done um, a survey, and you'll be shocked. Eighty-seven percent of Gambians want economic out of the country. Now, um, economic is here only to protect the president. Um, so, economic has little relevance in terms of um, crime in the communities of the Gambia because they are not deployed to address that. Um, but the presence of economic uh, poses a huge challenge. Uh, for me, um, one of the reasons why there is no security sector reform uh, primarily is because um, the political leadership, that is the president, uh, finds um, more confidence and comfort uh, with economic being present. And consequently, um, together with the uh, security leadership, the military intelligence and police, who merely want to maintain their trust, um, you know, keep things as they are, uh, there is therefore no interest within the security leadership community and the political uh, leadership uh, to engage in robust security sector reform. All that we see happen here in terms of security sector reform, basically, is about promotions uh, within the police, within the military, and, and other security agencies. And so for me, uh, this poses a security, national security challenge because um, when economics continues, one may ask for how long? We are now four or five years uh, to the end of this term. Um, if there are narratives, I know that, yes, there are still German loyalists in the military, but there are German loyalists even inside the National Assembly. There are German loyalists even inside the state house as uh, public officials. There are German loyalists in every sector of government society. In fact, German has his party here who maintain him as the supreme leader of that party, as a legally registered entity. All right? But uh, does that mean, therefore, these are all individuals armed and hell bent to subvert or to overthrow the government of the Gambia or threaten the security of the Gambia? So if we want to depend on that narrative, therefore, to keep economic here, which is not even there to secure uh, the Gambia, but to secure the presidency, uh, we are only prolonging, uh, deferring our challenges into the future. And, and that is a problem that, that needs to be addressed. So for me, um, uh, the presence of economic as it is, is unjustified. And this all the more comes back to the issue of political will. And I think as West Africans, and our organizations. And this is why I bring in the engagement with ECOWAS. It is high time we demand our political leaders to provide ethical leadership, value-based leadership, that you know people get committed to um, their words, people abide by democratic ideals, people abide by actual national interests, not merely to say it, but to really respect uh, national ideals, to respect values and ethics in leadership, because otherwise, I mean, what do we like in the Gambia or in any country in the sub-region? Gambia has adequate uh, technical capacity. We have adequate resources. We have adequate you know, materials of anything you can imagine to run a good society. But what we lack is ethical governance, all right? Based on value-based leadership and management. And until we address that as a people, uh, we will sit here, I mean, you know, making high sounding slogans and all of that. But at the end of the day, what do we see in Cote d'Ivoire? Why would they have a water has to be there for a third time? Why should that happen in, 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 in Mali? I mean, in, 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 in Conakry? Why, why do we have what we have in, in Mali, IBK? What kind of place was he provided? And you know, until what we have there today. I mean, go across the region, even in Senegal, there are threats to the, um, the, the time limit. I mean, uh, that, that is in, in place down there, the democracy that has been nurtured there for so long. And all that is not necessarily because we don't have the knowledge or the skills or the resources, it's because value-based ethical leadership is, is missing. 
And I think as civil society, if we are going to be the conscience of the people, if we are going to be um, the, you know, the safeguards of the, of the people's interests, you know, that is what we need to demand right now of our political class, that you provide ethical leadership. And in the Gambia, you know, the political leadership is bereft of any iota of ethics and values. This is why uh, we cannot see all the reforms uh, from 2017 to date, because otherwise by now, Gambia would have made huge progress, huge progress, you know? But even the draft constitution that we've had, on the first day it got to the parliament, they killed it. On what basis, all right? So you check through, and here, when I say ethical leadership, it is not merely about the president and the people, or the vice president and the people in the cabinet, but even our political parties. The progress we are failing to make in the Gambia is simply because uh, somebody talked about diaspora voting, for example, or I talked about this attestation. Just final point to give, illustrate this matter. In 2012, Gambian opposition parties formed what they call Gambia Opposition for Electoral, Electoral Reform, GOFA. They raised a number of issues that need changes in our election process system. 12 points. In 2015, they put them together, 12 points. And diaspora issue was raised. This attestation was raised and other issues. They submitted this demand to the president and copy to the speaker of the National Assembly, to the chairman of the IEC, you know, to the United Nations, um, 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 to even Jesse Jackson in the United States. Now, 2016, this is 2015, one year later, 2016, these political parties formed a coalition and again, in their MOU and in their manifesto, raise these issues as changes they would effect when they win power to, in order to bring about system change in this country. But from 2017, when they took over power, none of those changes were made. Only the first change they made was to change the age of the vice president in the constitution, because the, the first two vice presidents we have in the constitution, we are overaged. And so they have to meet that demand. Number two, they changed, uh, you know, um, another provision in the constitution that protects the tenure of lawmakers if they happen to be sacked from their party so they don't lose their seat. So these are the only two constitutional reforms we've had since 2017, purposely by the political leadership to suit their own particular interest. Why didn't they introduce time limits in the president? I mean, in, in the in the constitution. Why didn't they introduce uh, our election is fifth, uh, first past the post? Why did they introduce absolute majority in the election, and so on and so forth? But piecemeal to just do that purposely to cater for themselves, and then uh, we continue that on, uh, even when the president created a constitutional review commission to create a new constitution, a very progressive in terms of West Africa, there is no constitution that is more progressive than our draft constitution, not 2020. First day in parliament, I mean, ethical leadership, that is what we need to demand now as civil society. Otherwise, I don't see future for this region. And when you consider all other geopolitics around the world, terrorism, all right? I mean, climate change, um, you know, coronavirus pandemics and so on. If we don't have ethical leadership, look at all of our countries, how they have mismanaged COVID funds. In the Gambia, it's scandalous because of lack of ethical leadership. And this is what we need to demand as civil society in, in West Africa. Otherwise, I mean, our people are suffering poverty. Look, look at the, the recent last year, there was a report, I mean, you know, uh, on, on, on poverty, uh, I mean, lives in, in, in West Africa. It's scandalous. Mm -hmm. How majority of our people continue to wallow in poverty in a region that is so endowed with all sorts of resources. I mean, it's unacceptable. So I think these are the things we need to address as, as, as civil society and people in this region. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madi, for, for, for your you know, passionate submission. I just felt it was important for me to raise the question around the economic amidst the different security challenges that uh, you know all the speakers have mentioned. I think before I just run through our colleagues, we are, we are about two minutes off our time. I mean, in the next eight minutes thereabout, we will be closing uh, uh, the, the webinar. But I want to invite uh, His, uh, Our Excellency just to give a final remarks. And then Lami, you also give your final remarks, and then Jawara will give our uh, final remarks. So, Your Excellency, you have one minute to do this. 
uh, uh, um, what would you like to say to, to close this conversation? I would like to close it on a word of wisdom. I may not be wise, but uh, by age, but by exposure and by uh, interaction with the rest of so many people, citizens and the world at large. I would like us to take uh, the Gambian case as a learning curve, as a learning experience. For, the, for 22 years, Gambia has been under dictatorship and you, no one realistically should, should expect that come go democracy we have voted in, um, uh, in a democratic uh, coalition, everything is going to be 100%. Things that we have not been able to achieve we are big, uh, in terms of challenges, we need to learn from that and see as we move to nurture our democracy and governance, how do we really overcome those challenges? If everything is perfect, there is no need for us to even have this webinar. It's because life is a, is a, is a, is a process and we learn as we go. In fact, there needs to be clarification on the fact that so many people just jump and say, it's easy, you know, to just be behind the scene and say, oh, they have betrayed us. Lamin has said it, Madi has said it, that the, the political leadership has betrayed the country. Not because I was part of the coalition and I'm still part of the coalition, but it's important to, to recognize that we came in without a dime. Our import cover was just for one month. We had to look for money just to pay people salaries. Otherwise, the country would have been upside down. We were able to run Elter Skelter to get the EU, the World Bank, the uh, United Nations system to help us have that income co cover. We, we came again, to, we need to have a plan because without planning, there's no, nothing you can do. You understand? So this was not like interest-based, but it was the system. After 22 years of dictatorship, it's like, Post-conflict, I worked in, 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 in UNDP for five years after from 1997 to 2002, and I know post-conflict. Systems are broken. Systems of governance are broken. Legal instruments are broken. It's held, everything is upside down. So to really transform the, and have a foundation, build a solid foundation is something that is very challenging. So I think we need to transform our perspective, our way of understanding and analyzing situations. It's not because of things didn't happen or, uh, or based on the political leadership. There has been certain gaps, and I have said it frankly, the lack of political will in terms of really focusing on the reforms than any, any other thing. Now, my closing remarks is that that is uh, great for what see and uh, Civil, is it Civil Society for Change, your co-funders that have organized this. Uh, pardon me? Innovation for Innovation for Change. Innovation Africa for Hub. Change. Yes. Africa Hub. We appreciate your choosing the Gambia personally, and I think I can speak for all the Gambians on the platform that we appreciate you choosing the Gambia uh, to discuss our challenges, our opportunities. The, the challenges are there, we will go by them, learn from them. And of course, the opportunities are also there. The country is open and the fundamental thing is that the Gambians are ready never to have Gambia closed again to the world. We have reopened the foreign relationships, diplomatic, not only political diplomacy, but now it's economic diplomacy. And the economic diplomacy has brought so much to the country that we need to reckon that. The, the fact that we also need to have that the ECOWAS, the involvement of ECOWAS, ECOWAS and the African Union and so forth. We can have uh, African civil society to engage their governments, but it's also important for, for them to uh, see and show that they have uh, the voice of the people in ECOWAS. ECOWAS must be an ECOWAS of the people. They've already had an act, they have enacted that, the African Union should be the voice of the people because if you look at the agenda 2063, it means it should be a, a new renaissance driven by the people, by the African citizens. So, and of course this has to be in conclusion, it has to be inclusive, good governance, where civil society, uh, politicians, media, I see my daughter 
um, Khadija Jawara, who I've been working with and I have a lot of admiration because she's young and she's very dynamic in, in the process. Working with the media, the media played a fundamental role in the, in, in the, in the change. And we need, to, we need to really have the strategic partnerships and uh, work together and have the same common objective and goal that Gambia, Gambia's democracy is, is here and it will work by God's grace. But of course, it's not just sitting and talking about it, but action, working together, working together, having the same objective. And my flag is the Gambian flag, the African flag. And of course, behind it is Gambia first. We work on Gambia first, then we work sub-regionally, then we work regionally, and then the world at large. It is us who should really ensure that the, our democracy works. And we should not be angry. We should have a, the, my mom always tells me, in life, there are two things. One, first of all, you have to know what you want. That what you want is in the interest of the common good. Secondly, you have to have the approach in approach in terms of how you say it to get where you want, because nobody can fight against government. You have to have a strategic approach, an intelligent approach, where you can really stay relevant, stay active, and stay engaging to ensure that you can account, you can hold a government accountable. Now I can assure Thank you that you so nobody uh, suffer. Uh, in the Gambia and the sub-region. So we thank you so much. I thank you, Madam Moderator, Charles, and everyone who is on the platform, Madi, my sons, Madi, uh, Mood Lamin, and all those who are on, on this platform. And I am recommending strongly that the conversation on the Gambia should continue. And if you require that we support it in any way personally, or however, we will support this platform to be consolidated so that you see us through December 4th, 2021 and beyond, because democracy is not only elections. We go beyond that to do gov good governance, ensuring that everybody has uh, uh, meets or achieves his uh, aspiration as a nation. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you, Thank so you so much, Your Excellency. We really appreciate your feedback. Lamin, what would you have to say for one minute? What would you have to say to close this conversation? Thank you um, um, to board Maxi and Elevens and Hope Africa for this great conversation, needed conversation. I think it's very important. I want to encourage all of you and other partners to continue this. I think this is not just be here, it's just continue. Uh, we need to have more of it from now to the election so that at least we can okay. raise more awareness of the situation. And then um, in fact, entice civil society to be more active into supporting the and safeguarding democracy. One thing that I will say is nobody will come from, and nobody have came from anywhere to help us win the democracy for ourselves or move ourselves out of the dictatorship. It's us plus our African brothers and sisters out there that help us to deliver um, the democracy or the, the, the change that we had as a, in Gambia. So we need to safeguard it. We need to really be progressive and aggressive at the same time to safeguard it. Uh, we should not do apologetic, apologetical in terms of uh, the language of how we hold leaders who are betrayers, who are selfish, who have been really looking onto only their interests. Uh, African leaders, and especially West African leaders, have really you know, failed the citizenry for quite long. You know, when West Africa was going to be a sample for democracy in the world, um, we have seen that presidents and leadership have been betraying people and citizens for quite long. When presidents died for three years, now thinking of 15 years, you know, dropping a constitution, taking for 15 years. So that shows that you know we should not, and we have seen it, samples of it happening in West Africa. That's why the urgency for us to work together in protecting and preventing ourselves to be dragged back to the deficit, um, we need to we, we really need to work together and, and so that uh, the, you know the uncertainty is 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 big if if we do not guide this process um, as, as 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 citizens and empower the civil society educate them as much. Madi talked about ethical leadership. I think that's the solution. I completely agree with him. When we have integrity in ourselves as, as people, we will definitely deliver to our country, not to ourselves. And that's what many leadership are doing, including Gambia. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Lamy. Thank you. Jawa, are you there? 
Yes. Um, thank you very much, Maxi, for giving us this platform. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to be here. And this was a very interesting discussion. Looking forward to, uh, to being part of more of these type of things. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. I think um, one, one or two things I would like us to take away from this process is that this conversation has not ended here or cannot end here. We need to create other opportunities for us to follow up. There are so many pertinent issues that have been raised here that we need to pay attention to. If the Gambian project must indeed yield the results that we all craved in 2016. So a lot of, we need to invest a lot into rebuilding and, and you know the political will for our leaders the Gambian leadership to do the right thing, i.e. paying detailed attention to necessary reforms that has to be done. And of course, the support that it's required from us to give to the IEC, the Independent Electoral Commission, I believe, that is another important area that we need to invest a lot of, uh, a lot of our energy and resources. And of course, conscientizing the people to continue, you know, actively engage the different political parties, you know, asking questions, cross-examination of uh, uh, manifestos, you know, the campaign processes. I think these are electoral processes that contribute to the success, the free, the, uh, uh, you know, credibility of our electoral processes. And this is where uh, I love the different points that Madi raised on how civil society can better contribute to the process or the processes. So calling on civil society across the Gambia and beyond and indeed West Africa to be part of this process. Madi, you also raised the need for capacity development or uh, building of uh, the Gambian civil society, not only in advocacy, but of course in uh, democracy, governance and, 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 and the likes of it. And this is an area that we as WAXI will be actively exploring post this conversation. And like I already said, we would ensure that maybe in another uh, 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 couple of months, maybe two months or at least before the election, we should have at least two other conversations that we explore how far we are preparing you know, towards the elections in the Gambia. And of course, ECOWAS, I believe ECOWAS will be observing the elections, but before then, I know ECOWAS do offer different assistance to its members planning to hold elections. And I hope the Gambia will be exploring that you know, opportunity as well to make demand for the, 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 the key supports that they will require from ECOWAS at this point. Um, yes, so um, Madi, I'm reading all your comments, but time is really against us. Uh, I want to believe that uh, this is June. Uh, sometimes in August, we should, I mean, we would follow up with the different different groups within the Gambia. And sometimes in August or September, we should be having this conversation again to see how things may have changed and how, uh, 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 how close we are in preparation towards the election. So on this note, on behalf of Waxi Management and Board, and of course, um, uh, Innovation for Change African Hub, we want to thank every one of you, all the panelists for being part of this conversation, and of course, to all the participants from the Gambia, West Africa and beyond, we want to thank you for your contributions, for your participation. To those who joined us on Facebook, we also want to thank you for being a part of this conversation. This is not the end of it. We will be alerting you when next we will be taking on the Gambia and the forthcoming elections again. To Waxi team, thank you so much. And uh, it is goodbye from us here. Uh, thank you so much. Have a good day and we will see you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Omo, and everyone. Bye bye. Yeah. Thank you, Madi. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Please, please share your feedback via the link we shared. And I mean, Lamit, your feedback is well noted. I mean, for subsequent okay. events. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect. I've already said also in the feedback session. So you find no it. No problem. That's All right. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, bye, thank bye. you, Lamin. I've noted the point on working with local media in the Gambia to actually put the program live. Yeah, thank you so much. That's really important. That's important. Take a note of that. Thank All you, right. Your Excellency. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Oh, okay. I don't know how many people are still on board. Okay, I think we have a few. If you can put on your, your camera for a few seconds that comes, we like to take a picture. I'm so sorry. I should have done that. It was part of my responsibility. I'm so sorry. So please, can we put on, can we put on our cameras? Please. I think we still have about 25 of us on the on the platform. Please put on your camera and the uh, comes when you're ready. You can, oh, I'm so sorry. I think my camera is on. Please, can we all put on our camera, please? Okay. Comes, if you're ready, you can, yeah, our camera, and I'm happy all the speakers are still here. So Comes, can we have the group picture? Let's know who is coordinating it, Leanne. Would that be you? Let's it's smile. Easy. I know we're going to the one coordinating it. Gambia. Can we smile, please? <laughs> Smiling for the Gambia. <laughs> yes, let's smile for the Gambia. It shall yeah. be well, definitely. Yeah. All will be well, inshallah. The smiling coast. <laughs> mm, yeah, forever. All right. Thank inshallah. you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Mandy, Lamine, and Jawara. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yep. Thank you. Bye.